Hi everybody, I'm Michelle Moog Kusa. I'm the executive director of the Bob Moog Foundation and we are here in Charlotte tonight at Tara Bush's I Speak Machine performance, which was absolutely amazing. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the Bob Moog Foundation. Our, our mission is to ignite creativity at the intersection of science, music, and innovation. It's essentially a mirror reflection of Bob's legacy itself. We do this through a twofold uh, focus of education and historic preservation. We have an educational initiative called Dr. Bob Sound School, through which we teach second graders the science of sound. We have developed a 10-week curriculum that gives kids a very experiential, hands-on, innovative way to engage in sonic science, essentially. Our other project is a historic preservation project. The Bob Moog Foundation has its own archive that is rich in instruments and schematics and photographs, um, correspondence, um, and many other medium. And tonight, one of the very special things we did is we brought two of the, our vintage instruments from the archive, the ARP 2600 that we um, have on permanent loan from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and the very, very rare Moog Apollo, which was the prototype to the Polymoog. Uh, we brought those both down here um, for Tara to play, and we don't, we don't do that very often, but we do it maybe a couple times a year. We pull those instruments out, have them restored, and uh, both of them sounded absolutely amazing tonight. So we are here um, celebrating Bob Moog's legacy with, with Tara and uh, having a great time.
Thank you. Film and say pop videos, the kind of two things where you mesh music and uh, uh, moving images together. And um, both seem to be done traditionally in a kind of weird way. With film, often the music is an afterthought, either people adding songs or whatever to a film or writing a score after, after the film is, is created. And then with pop music, of course, someone writes a song and then someone goes, hey, I can create a video to that. And it all feels a little bit afterthought, the whole thing. Now, two people I was a really big fan of, um, and always have been, is uh, Sergio Leone and uh, Ennio Morricone, who did the um, Spaghetti Western trilogies with Clint Eastwood, Fistful of Dollars, Few Dollars More, and Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and so forth. And uh, Leone used to give little sections of the script off to uh, Morricone and he would go off and write a little bit of a score from the script and then when that was being filmed, that scene, the actors and the cameraman and the director of photography would have and the director would have that in mind while that was being filmed. I always loved that idea that everyone would would have that music in their, in their, in their mind when, when it was being filmed. So we kind of tried to take it a stage further and, um, and that was literally to, from, from a story, to write a script and a score before the film was made. So the script writer and the composer were together batting ideas back and forth so you'd have a scene. The story would be written, um, a little bit of music would be created, they'd listen to that, they'd talk about it and go back and forth until it was pretty, you know, pretty close to what we would expect the film to be. And then the film, that, that scene would be filmed. And so the director and the actor and everybody would have a really, really, really clear idea about what was going on in their heads in terms of the score and obviously would have a clear script. So that's what we wanted to do. And then with the films that we're making, they are designed specifically to be shown with a live score, live. So they're shot with a little bit more space. And also at times there's space to kind of look aside to the, the terror playing the music as well. So that's, your focus can drift from, from the screen to terror and back to the screen. It is a narrative, so the main focus is going to be the screen. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of like the process. We think it's, I don't know, hope it works.
the whole thing about analog synthesizers is at some point, people started to recognize, wait a minute, we have all this great technology, great digital computer technology that's so functional, but there's something missing. And the thing that's missing is that these older pieces of technology had a sound that really connected, emotionally connected with people. And I think largely what it was, was the older analog technology was more like acoustic sound, more like the human voice. And people really connect with that because it's variable, it's fallible, uh, it's not perfect, but it also has a richness, a tone that connects with people's auditory experience of reality. Uh, digital technology, computer technology is incredibly powerful and beautiful sounding, but it doesn't always sound like our human experience of reality, like sound as we experience it as animals. And these older vintage pieces of technology are not perfect in their creation of sound, but their sound is more like acoustic instruments of the human voice. And the human voice is the core of our musical interest. And anything that sounds like the human voice connects with us emotionally. And I think that's the draw of analog instruments. The ARP 2600 is one of the first portable synthesizers right up there with the Moog Mini Moog. Um, Alan R. Perlman and Dennis Collin uh, created this device and it's, it just has a really human feel to it while it has this technological power to create such a vast variety of sound. And the ARP 2600 is one of the most desired analog synthesizers ever created. The sounds that it creates are somehow more acoustic than they are electronic, which I think people at the time in 1970 or 1971 would have said, you're crazy, this sounds nothing like a violin. But compared to some of the things we came out with, with in the later 70s or 80s, this is more of an acoustic instrument. And people have the ability to interact with it directly through like the physical experience of uh, touching these sliders. It makes for a very musical experience and people love the thing. And that's why they are so sought after and why when Tara is doing this performance, why it has a, a level of communication that's a little bit higher than the technology that we were, we're so, that is so accessible today. The original Moog Apollo uh, was David Luce's synthesizer that could play more than one note at a time. And uh, Moog hired him to make a polyphonic synthesizer, a synthesizer that could play the more one more than one note at a time. And it developed into what was called the Polymoog, which Moog released in 1975, and everyone was very excited about it because it was the first synthesizer. You could play synthesizer sounds, and you could play the entirety of the keyboard. You could even just like hold all the notes down, and it would make some sound. And so the original Moog Apollo was like that, and it was used by Keith Emerson in his tour in 1974, and a variety of songs were basically based on that synthesizer. But that was the, the prototype to the Moog Polymoog, which came out in 1975. What we're looking at here is the prototype of the Polymoog 280A, which came out later than that, but they wanted to provide a, a device that would create synthesizer sounds but you could play all the notes and you could play it like an electric piano. And it has 14 presets and there is limited functionality that you can control to create the sounds. Uh, but it's a very expressive device. And it has what's called a polycom chip. For each of these notes, there is a chip that'll, that is an entire synthesizer on its own. So each of these keys has its own synthesizer, which is really cool. So when you're playing it, you have the ability to play these sounds and each note you play is its own synthesizer. And this is in the Bob Moog Foundation collection. 
And we're so proud to have it because it's such a stepping stone to what came later. And also, it's such an expressive and beautiful device. We were so happy that Tara could use it uh, to do what she was doing. This is uh, Michelle Mokus's personal uh, Voyager. The Voyager was the last synthesizer designed by Bob Moog. And the Voyager, which came out in 2002, was Bob's uh, modern version of the Mini Moog. He took all of his synthesizer knowledge that he had developed uh, from 1964 on, and he put it into this modern device and created an extremely expressive, beautiful sounding, and functionally complex device. That's what this is. And it's fantastic. Uh, Tara is fantastic with the Voyager and just pulls some really great sounds out of it, especially because she's so obviously influenced by some of the 1970s horror movies that have a very distinctive analog sound. And she is able to coax that out of this device designed by Bob Moog. And she does it so well, and it's so expressive and so functionally interesting, but also texturally and aesthetically beautiful. Uh, so this device is fantastic for her, and especially in combination with this vintage device, which is probably, let's see, when would this have come out? Like 1978 or so. And this synthesizer, which even though it's an ARP, it's still kind of Moog because this particular version of the ARP 2600 has a Moog filter in it. The 4012 filter, which ARP kind of lifted from Moog, it's a ladder filter. So it actually has a Moog sound, but it has this ARP functionality. But even so, when you're playing with the filter, you're getting an, uh, a Moog filter. And Tara really has the ability to coax some expressive sounds out of the Moog filter. And so tonight's performance, certainly, she was getting these great Moog sounds from all of these keyboards, which all ultimately have a Moog sound to them. Yeah.